Sensor scan to one half parsec. On screen. Weapons are at maximum. It's more like a big ball of wibbly wobbly, tiny whiny stuff. Open a channel. All vipers, break, break, break! Impossible to see the future. This is the emergency holographic doctor speaking. You wish the energy talking. Helmsman laid a new course. Watch how I saw. Now, it's gone completely. Engage. Hello, and welcome to the Save Sci-Fi Podcast. I'm your host, David, and joining me tonight is Hawk. G'day, guys. Uh, tonight we're talking about Halo, and with the passing of Glenn A. Larson, the creator of the original creator of Battlestar Galactica, Buck Rogers, Knight Rider, and a heap of other shows, the back half of the show is going to be dedicated to him. So... I'm definitely looking forward to when we get to that. But first things first, Halo. Um, Where to start with Halo? Yeah. Okay, how about this? What was your first Halo game? The original, Halo Combat Evolved. I didn't play it on the console. I managed to get my hands on the PC copy and... Quite frankly, I prefer, I would prefer to continue playing the Halo series on PC over the Xbox. Fair enough. My first one I got was actually when I got my first Xbox, which was a 360. So my first Halo game was actually Halo 3, which I played till I was effectively in a coma. <laughs> it and is a it fantastic took, series. It took me years to get Halo 1 and Halo 2, because I'd played them sporadically at friends' places, but I never had an original Xbox. So I'd played them sort of on and off, but yeah. But anyway, last week, the Master Chief Collection came out, um, which is Halo 1 Remastered, Halo 2 Remastered, Halo 3 and Halo 4 um, on Xbox One. And Would it kill them to put it out on the 360 as well? They're already all out on the 360. You can play no, them then, all on the 360. No, they're not. You still can't get number 2 for the 360. Yes, you can. Number 2 for the original Xbox works on the 360. Yeah, but I'd like the remastered version. Yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> exactly. So, well, it's not my fault that you don't have an Xbox One. I can't afford it. It's not my fault. <laughs> anyway, um, if you could choose one piece of, like, the uh, yeah, sorry, brain fart. Um, if you could go back to one piece of Halo lore, like, the whole story, you could chop it up into bits and make a movie out of it. What section would you make a movie from? I don't really see a choice. The best one I can think of for the movie would be the first one. It was I complete, really. I reckon Fall of Reach. I have to disagree there. Mate, because I've got the original books that the lore is based off, and f and Halo Reach is so far different to what the actual book Fall of Reach was, and Fall of Reach leads up to the Halo games. So you yeah, pretty much want to combine f the Fall of Reach book original variant, not the not the game Reach, with the events of Halo One. No, yeah. no, yeah. I. See, the, the Fall of Reach book, I have I have read that. It was a while ago, admittedly, and I'm not exactly sure what happened to it. I've got, I bought that set that had the three books in it. Same, um, same set I got. <laughs> yeah. Not sure what happened to the Reach book. I've got the other two. I'm actually looking at them. They're over there on my bookcase with my Matthew Riley and my George R. R. Martin and my Stephen King. But anyway, um, I... I I've enjoyed the Halo Reach games, but it'd be really hard to convert the Halo Reach game into a movie. But the fall of the reason I said Fall of Reach is you could have that sort of tell the story of how Reach fell from one of the other Spartans' point of view, like from Master Chief's point of view, because the game doesn't touch on Master Chief, if you know what I mean. I know I, I know the game sort of slips away from the book, but the way I look at it is the core material is the original 
material, and the original material is the game, the original Halo game. Agreed. After the original Halo game came the books, which is sort of a secondary thing. It's like books for Star Wars, books for Star Trek, books for Stargate. They're all secondary to the games. So years later, another game comes along, Halo Reach, that tells the story before Halo 1, and to me, that trumps the book, even though the book came first. I don't, because they left so many holes in it. I mean, Halo 3, sorry, not Halo 3, Halo Reach, the game, you were playing as a Spartan 3. Now, if we're completely discounting the book lore, then they've just completely pissed all over the creator. And the reason, because the Spartan 3s never got Molnir armor, and you're playing a Spartan 3 in Molnir armor literally just throws the entire lore away because Molnir was too expensive to produce and Spartan 3s were mass-produced. Spartans. So, yeah. they're really just... It's never explicitly... It, it's it's sort of... Reason. Yeah, continue. Because um, at the time of Reach, there was a split between the creative directors and... The wonderful people, mi wonderful people of Microsoft and, the stu and their studio Bungie. Now, the original creators went on to go, okay, we can't work with this. You're over managing us, so we're walking. And they went, fine, no worries. And they proceeded to, with what's left of it, without the creative director team, direction team, created Halo Reach. That direction team went on to create 343 Industries, which we now have to thank for Halo 4, uh, the remastered versions, and the basic, and the upcoming yeah. Halo 5. Yeah. But on the note of Halo 4, it was the first Halo game that I played that didn't, I, ha I don't know how to put it in other words, didn't feel like a Halo game. Like, all of the Halo games, including Breach, which... Uh, um, all have that replayability where you can play the game through 20 times and it's still fun. I don't know what it was about Halo 4, but I just couldn't do that. It just felt like it was missing that weird Sp little X factor. Like, Destiny's got that X factor that you can play Destiny, which is made by Bungie, the same guys that made Halo, again and again and again. It's a grinding game, it really is, but you can still play it for hours but i agree it's halo 4 just I don't, I don't understand what like, there's nothing tangible that's missing it's still a good game it's just missing that little replayability thing, thing. yeah and i agree completely on that but part of me has to ask is that because of the game the game design or the limitation of the of the console they were making it on making it for because by that point they made halo 4 360 was a heavily dated game and couldn't do what they really wanted to do with the game yeah that's true and i think they went a little bit um they, they got ambitious again which well, is what the series needed yeah but. They, they also went very call of duty in the multiplayer which i didn't like well call of duty up until advanced warfighter has basically been stagnant for quite a while yeah that well they see the halo multiplayer has always been different and a lot of fans have sort of cried about the differences but i actually really enjoyed the differences between the halo multiplayer online and the call of duties the battlefields i don't i don't know why i just hate those multiplayer games there's something about it that just annoys the crap out of me and halo 4 had that about it and it just annoyed the crap out of me i want a multiplayer game i can plonk into run around and shoot people if i get shot at i can get the hell out of trouble if i want to halo 4 was you spawn into a game people who've played the game for weeks at a time have already got the best weapons before we even start the game and you're dead you respawn and you're dead and you respawn and you're dead and i just got the shits of that really quickly and with its non sort of replayability in the campaign, which I think I only played the campaign through two or three times, 
Like, I know where every bad guy spawns in every single level of Reach, every single level of Halo 3, and parts of the original Halo, thanks to the Anniversary Edition. Um, but Halo 4, I've barely touched it since it came out. Yeah, and I almost find that sad in its own right. I'm definitely looking forward to Halo 5, though. It looks. I haven't managed to play much of Halo 4. I know it's their grand vision to continue the Master Chief story, but well, hopefully it'll pick up and I'll be able to get into it in the future. Maybe once I get a, once I get another a new job and I can actually afford to buy a Xbox One. Yeah. But but right now I'm seeing Halo as having the same major issue in that they need to recreate it again, much like Mass Effect is going to have to with the their proposed new game. Yeah. But the thing is, what they need to do is they need to find that, that sort of spark again. That The spark that allows you to play a game over and over without it sort of getting dull. Um, since the Master Chief Collection came out, I've been smashing Halo 1 and Halo 2 on the hardest difficulty settings I can. And I'm really enjoying it, even though it's a bit of a grind and it, there's, there are moments where you're like, got almost no health, no shields, no ammo, and you're just like, well, I'm totally shit freak now. It's still a lot of fun to play. It is. I mean, my first competitive against a friend Halo experience was Halo 1 against a friend of mine who made the challenge to me of doing a run-through thing. He'd been playing it on his Xbox for almost a year and a half before I got my copy on PC. And kudos to him for having, A, the patience to do that. But I wound up with... going over to his place with three other friends to judge it. The rules were first to reach the finish line, the f finishing credits with the least amount of deaths in the shortest time possible. Now, you'd think Halo 1, that's going to be a pretty decent challenge, right? Yeah. Turned out I made it there on the PC in about... Half an... Oh, he was halfway through. I had the credits rolling by the by the time he was about halfway through. I died about six times, four of which were my own stupidity with a plasma grenade. <laughs> I love plasma grenades. Yeah, same. I can't get over the their effects. F favorite trick. He plasma grenade, time. armor lock. <laughs> you didn't have armor lock in Halo 1 the first... In yeah, the no, early you, days. You, you, you had in. You didn't really get it till sort of Halo Reach, but yeah, still, or, I like how they've updated the way things go. But yeah, it's like um, one of my favorite tricks in Halo Three multiplayer. I used to love getting into Forge and making custom maps. The um, level I can't think of what it's called off the top of my head, but it's this beach. At the bottom of the hill is the beach, and you've at the top of the hills this military base. And there's a switch that opens the gate that'll sort of keep people out or let people in. I barricaded it up and had it so you had to get a bomb from the middle at the bottom of the map up into the middle of the base. And in order to do so, you could either go down through the underground tunnels, which I'd blocked off, but you could get through thanks to um, if you could well place a couple of grenades, you could get through. Or you could kamikaze charge the wall, and if you could get up on top of that, then you could open the gate. Once you open the gate, you could drive the wraith into the base because the people outside the gate had a wraith. The people inside the base had a rocket launcher. So that was the sort of way of balancing that. And that was, I don't know how many times I played that. Um, the, there was a couple of other custom maps on Halo 3 that I absolutely loved. The level that had the... Um, it was almost like a cratery pit. I might have been called, the level might have been called Sandbox. Someone did up this brilliant map where the outside of the map was jet black. You could not see a thing. But the inside of the map 
glowed bright enough for you to see. And it was an infection map. You would spawn and jump into a warthog and drive like hell through terrain you could not see, except for where the headlights were pointing. The zombies could see you and would chase after you would chase after you and run you down and eventually kill you. And I have never been more scared in my life than playing that map at night with the lights out in the middle of a storm. Because the, the TV is blank. I'm running from zombies. There's lightning and wind. My windows are shaking. And I'm just like, wow, this is insane. So yeah, that was a thing. Yep. So yeah. Yeah, I go I, sneaking over to a mate's place. Oh, in high school, it, this is always good. Um, one me and one of my mates used to sneak off in the in the free periods, um, and disappear back to his place. We lived like two minutes walk from the school, and we'd normally play Xbox, and that was my introduction to Halo. And I used to play sort of the odd multiplayer here and there, and I had bits and pieces of Halo One and Two. But yeah, definitely my favourite of all of them would be Halo Three. Second Halo part. Three has so much potential in it. Yeah, yeah. Of all the of all of them that I've played, Halo Three would definitely be my favourite, followed closely by Reach, only because of its for the upgrades done to the Forge engine. It was yeah. Some of the custom maps that came out on Halo Reach were just insane, and I'm looking forward to what comes out on the um, Halo Anniversary. No, sorry, Master Chief Collection Forge stuff because it's got massive potentials and it looks absolutely gorgeous. So, anyway, that concludes our ranting about Halo. So, we're going to run our ads. Um, if you're unaware, this podcast is affiliated with the Save Sci Fi page on Facebook. So, jump on over to Facebook, give us a like, and let us know what you think. Um, I am going to. Move us on to an ad break now. What's the best gift for the fangirl or fanboy in your life? Why passes to Hawaii Con, of course. The 2015 four day pass is on sale now through December 31st and makes an amazing present that will give out of this world memories. You can get an extra special present via the Kickstarter campaign where you can help pick the stars who will appear at the next event. You can choose stars from Doctor Who, Torchwood, Stargate, Firefly, and Farscape. To purchase tickets or more information on the event, visit hawaiicon.com. Before, before there was dust, before the air became poison, before the companies, strays, dragon smugglers and thieves, will they prevail? WWW the Star Crystal, remember, dare to blink and it may all be gone. Hello and welcome back to the Save Sci-Fi Podcast. I am your host, David, and joining me still is Hawk. Howdy. And um, there's no easy way to say it. A couple of nights ago, Glenn A. Larson passed away. He was probably one of the greatest uh, producers of American, t- uh, producers and writers of American TV of the late 70s and 80s there's quite a few shows with his name to them um you've got switched battlestar galactica the original battlestar galactica sort of series from the from the 1970s battlestar galactica 1980 buck rogers in the 25th century the misadventures of sheriff lobo uh bj and the bear that takes us almost to 1981 um Quincy M.E., Trauma Center, um, Manimal, Orderman, uh, my brain cannot process that word. My brain cannot process that word. Uh, Masquerade. Masquerade. Why could my brain not process that word? I don't know. Maybe Vampire wasn't in front of it. Yeah, it's just sort of uh, failing brain. Um, Cover up. The Fall Guy. Knight Rider. Now, Knight Rider. Knight Rider. Rider. <laughs> yeah. Now, that one, no one really knows about. It was actually a <laughs> sequel to the original four seasons of Hasselhoff's Knight Rider. 
Only problem was they went a little bit too cowboy with it. Uh. And by cowboy, I'm talking a little out there. Like, how would you feel about an AI in a hovering 747? That was the show. That I remember this. I remember this. I and was it would trying drive to figure out this a team of crime fighting cars and their drivers. I was trying to think of what that was called for ages. I just. Ooh, that was my me getting a text message. Um, I just. All I remember is the four wheel drive that could talk, Knight Rider style, and it's smashing into a building somewhere and whinging about being damaged. That's pretty much the extent of my memories of that show, and I could not remember what the hell it was. Yeah, that's the sa that is the show, oh, and a, in a couple episodes, they actually brought Hasselhoff and Kit back in to try and boost its flagging, floundering ratings, which is why it appeared and disappeared <laughs> in about twenty seconds. Yeah, it only had a single twenty-two episode season, but for what they had, it was a pretty good show. Needed work, but still, for what they had at the time. Yeah. And that's the thing about sort of sci-fi series like that. You can't just sort of go off one sort of series. You look at so many sci-fis only last one season where most sci-fi series, and you can look at Star Trek, look at Stargate, look at um, the original Battlestar Galactica, even the new Battlestar Galactica. It takes that first season just, just to set the characters up. No, it takes that first season just for them to find their footing, let alone set the characters up. Setting the characters up can be most of season two, like it was in Stargate. It takes, like, the, st like again, Stargate, which is not related to him at all, took almost three seasons to get up and running and going good. And a lot of sci-fis aren't given that. Like, Auto Man, look, it had one season. Um, there's a show called BJ and the Bear? Sorry, that's another one of his shows. I'm looking at the list of his shows, thanks to Google. It's prob BJ and the Bear's probably got something something close to, um, like, a opposite view to Smokey and the Bandit, for crying out loud. Yeah, I have no idea. It's just on the list, and I was like, what the hell? Magnum P.I., that was probably... No, that it was probably his most successful outside yeah. of Battlestar and Knight Rider. Yeah, I was just about to say, it's... It's got eight seasons. Oh, it's got eight years worth of runtime, according to nineteen eighty 1980 to nineteen eighty eight, according to Google. Most of the other ones only really had one year. So, in some cases, what the hell is Nightman? I have honestly got no idea. According to Google, after being struck by lightning, a San Francisco musician can tune into others' evil thoughts. Alrighty then. <laughs> it sounds like one of those ones that would be fun to watch once. Yeah. And probably half the time you're scratching your head going, what the fuck is going on here? If you want to giggle, Google Nightman 1997 and have a look at that costume. What the actual fuck? It's like Batman, but bright blue. It's weird and wrong and what the hell am I looking at? Uh, how about we, we focus on the original... Actually, piece of trivia for you. One of his shows used a heap of props from a previous show he had worked on that got cancelled way too soon. Do you Can you name both those shows? Off the top of my head, no. I'll give you a hint. The props came from Battlestar Galactica, the original series. Nah, nothing? Nah. Buck Rogers in the 25th century reused a large amount of the original Battlestar Galactica props. Because he had them from the Battlestar Galactica when it was cancelled and his next project was Buck Rogers in the 25th century and he went, well, I've got all this shit from Battlestar left, let's just use that. <laughs> yeah, why not? I mean, other notable shows that have done that. Power Rangers. Yeah, let's just leave Power Rangers alone and just it it it, it lives in a corner away from uh, everything. <laughs> God. I 
damn it, why has my mouse got to do this now? Because it hates you. I'm glitching in my, um... On my aim down sight button. Just in case you're interested, I am playing Far Cry. At the same time I'm doing this, so... Great, now it starts working. Have a crazy guy with a knife running at me, and now it starts working. And stops working again, right? When I need <laughs> a fucking range kill. <laughs> uh, isn't that always the case? Yeah. So, what do you remember from his shows? If you could sort of pick one highlight from all of those shows, what would you sort of go to if you were sort of there to remember him? Since I'm trying to get us back on topic, it's not really working. Uh, I'd have to say my favourite of his shows are Knight Rider. Okay. Just, I was going through a bit of a bad set, shall we say, at the time, and went over to a mate's place, and they just started with the re-releasing, re-releasing everything. Yeah. On DVD and whatnot. Yeah. I actually got a heap of Knight Rider stuff at one of the Capacities near me. Last I looked. Yeah. Um, okay, here's a question for you. Knight Rider plus Kit. They have to have a race against Herbie. Who would win? Which version of Kit are we talking? The bestest is the stillest. Okay, so that rules out the recent remake of him. Yeah. Uh, then I'd have to go season four, Kit beats the pants off Herbie. He just can't beat Super Pursuit Mode. Damn thing turns into a fucking rocket car. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and I've won. <laughs> I I'm not kidding. You hit Super Pursuit Mode, the freaking rocket just sprouts out of the boot. Ignites and suddenly he's pushing the mark. Okay, that versus the car from Men in Black, the first movie. Why do you think they got the idea for the first movie's Men in Black car? I'm well aware of that. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to put my money on the Men in Black car because it is a newer version of Knight Rider, but at the same time, I'm not 100% certain whether or not the kit factor, because he would have had a shite ton of experience by that point under his belt. <laughs> would make the difference over just a human-driven one. Fair enough. Okay, uh, so I think it's about time we jump on to the sci-fi verses. Now, this week's verses was a little bit different to normal. Normally, I whack at least one sci-fi person up against the... Well, it's normally something randomly selected. Um, but this week, I decided to go with Spy versus Spy. We have James Bond versus Jason Bourne. Oh, so who would win in that sort of fight? Uh, okay, Jason Bourne is more of the action type, but what version of Bond are we talking about? Current Bond. Relatively few gadgets. He can't pull a laser out of his ass because plot point number forty-seven. Effectively, the most recent Bond versus Jason Bourne, before he was a, pu a pussy. Mm. I, I reckon it would st it would probably go down as range combat, sniper v sniper, and under those circumstances, Jason would have it. Agreed. At the same time, I'm also, I also think it would be pretty goddamn close between them. Oh yeah. If it came into a closer range thing, or even depend depending on how pissed off Daniel Craig's Bond was at that point in time, then it may, even as a sniper thing, it may have been the best possible result. Dead tie, both of them dead. Yeah. Well, um, how about this then? Closer range, pistol slash hand-to-hand combat. 
I think Jason would have that over Bond. Simply because the current Bond is not Superman. Yeah, my question is this. It again comes down to how which version of current Bond are we talking about? Because in the first one, he was pretty much true to the Bond that everyone knows and loves and sometimes gets bored with. Debonair, a bit of a womanizer, not much in the way of gadgets like most of them, but still very upper class. Yeah. Second one, he went completely off the rails, off the reservation, and was overall kicking ass, taking names across the goddamn planet. Yeah. Then the third one, he was recovering from the events of the second one, and was still medically not fit to yeah. go back into serve, go back into action. But they, he went back in anyway. Yeah, that was Skyfall. Yeah. yeah. So if we're talking number two, so th- Casino Royale, Quantum of Solace, or Skyfall is what you're asking. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, go- since number two was relatively speaking his prime. Out of those three movies, we'll go with that. So I'd still have to say slightly on the Jason, but that's only because Jason fights dirtier. Yeah. Yeah. But on, on the other ones, it would just be uh, if, if, a born whitewash. There would be no contest. If Bondy had his had his little gadgets, I reckon Bondy would stand a chance. But since Bond doesn't, um, since in this scenario doesn't really have gadgets, I think Jason Bourne would probably have it. He's substantially better at disguising himself. He's substantially better at um, sort of hand-to-hand combat based on what we see in the movie. He's substantially better with a pistol and he's substantially better with ranged weaponry. I think it it wouldn't be an easy kill, don't get me wrong, but... It wouldn't be an easy win. It wouldn't be an, it wouldn't be an easy win, but it, I reckon he would have it overall. Yeah. Oh yeah, this week before I forget, I forgot to sort of kind of forgot to do the um, vote on the enemy ship. Sorry about that. It was Thursday before I realised. A little bit too late to do it. Um, I'll be putting up the picture tonight, so yeah. Woo! Anyone who wants to vote on to the enemy ship's secondary weapons, which is the heavy weapons that do sort of like photon torpedoes, nukes, um, the sort of the heavy long-range damaging attacks that's the secondary weapons that's what we'll be voting on this week so yeah anyway uh, that's it for this week's short podcast we had a few minor technical issues to begin with so we sort of got held up and couldn't quite do what we were hoping to do which is a full show uh next week we'll be talking uh interstellar um, as well as, I honestly have no idea, whatever pops up in the news normally is how I work it. Something interesting pops up in the news and we talk about it, just like when, um, oh god, I'm an arsehole now, I've forgotten his name, Glenn Larson sort of passed, this sort of became one of the segments. So, anyway, uh, we'll be, we'll see you next week and hopefully we'll have a full hour worth of podcast as opposed to this short little 25, 30 minute one. Um, any last words? Stay safe, guys. Have a good one. And also, for those of us who are Star Trek lovers, do be advised that Star Trek Online has released their new expansion, which is taking us back to the Delta Quadrant. Yay! Oh yeah, before I forget, I played the ad for it earlier. Um, Hawaii Con has started its Kickstarter. Jump on over to that and check it out. HawaiiCon is absolutely fabulous. I'm looking at potentially going this year. I dragged him, David along, but there's not enough space in my... Sorry, Hawk along, but there's not enough space in my luggage for him. Sorry. I will be... I will. If I had the money, I would try and get over there, but I'll make do. Yeah. Um, so, so, like I said, jump over, check out their Kickstarter. There's all sorts of cool things to see. Um, and we shall see you... Uh, we shall see you next week. No worries. Have a good one, guys. On screen. Weapons right back. It's more like a big ball of wibbly wobbly, tiny whiny stuff. Open a channel. All vipers, break, break, break! Impossible to see the future. This is the
emergency holographic doctor speaking. You wish to your energy talking. Helmsman laid a new course. Watch how I saw it. Now, it's gone completely. Engage. Uh, Hawaii con ad. Great skills, me. I have failed again. What's the best gift for the fangirl or fanboy in your life? Why passes to Hawaii Con, of course. The 2015 four-day pass is on sale now through December 31st and makes an amazing present that will give out-of-this-world memories. You can get an extra special present via the Kickstarter campaign where you can help pick the stars who will appear at the next event. You can choose stars from Doctor Who, Torchwood, Stargate, Firefly, and Farscape. To purchase tickets or more information on the event, visit HawaiiCon.com. over onto the Facebook page for HawaiiCon and give him a shout out. Um, tell him that I sent you, you know, you want to. Um, so yeah, anyway, that's, that's David. I'm out of here. Have fun and I shall see you next week.